think that's where a lot of people go go bad with a pup. They throw them in a pen and just throw feed to them every day. And to me, you got to make a connection with them. Some guys don't agree with me on that, but I think you got to have a good bond with a dog. It's real simple, I think, with a pup, and a lot of people don't understand it. When a pup is ready to start, it will start. You can't force a pup to start, and you can't force a pup to treat. It has to do it on its own. Fine. Yeah, it's going great. Um, is there anything else you want to add about Clover or Chirpy or any of these dogs we're talking now? I guess anything you want to talk about their style or if there's any funny or interesting stories or memories that come to mind when you think about those dogs? Well, I just remember some of the first casts I ever put Chirpy in, she'd strike in there and I'd say, Strike Chirpy! And people would look at me and they'd say, That ain't no way that's a female. I said, oh yeah, that's her. She had a big old male dog mouth. And uh, why in the world would a man call a dog chirpy with a mouth like that? <laughs> that's one thing I got a lot in a lot of casts with her. I remember I hunted her one in a cast for you. Uh, I, I think I won the cast. It wasn't. A, we didn't get in a big big coon train contest or nothing. But that Bill's right. You know, guys would. You, she would open in there, and you'd think it's some big old eighty-pound male dog in there. Just you, we had. And I remember them summer nights. Some people would be sleeping with the windows open, and uh, we didn't care where we turned them dogs loose. If that thing looked coony, we was sending them. You know, <laughs> it was it was easier to ask for forgiveness than it was for, for, for permission. You know, so we just, you know, hell, they're supposed to be sleeping. You know, so we'd turn them up in there, and then. Next thing you know, there's old Big Mouth Chirpy go roaring up in there and come treed, swallowed up treed. Uh, there's been many nights uh, back in the day, you know, if you, t you talk about funny things, uh, seen many people in their underwear we probably shouldn't have saw. <laughs> you know, they'd come out on their porch yelling or they'd be looking around out the windows, you know. But, you know, back then we was young and dumb. We didn't care, you know. We was just treeing coons, you know, having fun with it. No. Yeah. For sure. Moving on to the, I guess, the next generation, you want to talk about some of the next dogs that come out of those? Well, then I guess the next good cross would be when they crossed Old Clover on Fred Bodenberg's Bernadine. Bernadine female. She was a big old stout female, and there again, too, huge mouth and a tree dog, boy. Oh, Maud. Yep. Uh, so we ended up taking her down and bred to Clover, and uh, out of that cross come Stylish Bull, Parsley's Stylish Bull, Parsley, I guess was his Parsley's name. Parsley's Raging Bull. Raging Bull. Uh, Jody Slusher had uh, Johnson's Delta Rebel. Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Bought off of Jody. I liked old Bull, or uh, Rebel. Rebel's a track dog, and uh, we got to tune hunt and get hooked up with old Jody. He worked General Motors, and he'd work second shift, get hooked up with him, and I tried to buy old Rebel, and uh, well, he just impressed me. You want to talk about one? No, oh, that dog was loud. Loud. Whew. And Jody, Jody, if anybody knows Jody, I love Jody. I really do. He's a lot of fun. I had, I think, as we got older uh, in the hunts, we started respecting more of each other. But you know, a lot of people, you know, Jody was he was a different character. He was a good dog man. He was hard on one. He liked them, you know. But he'd talk bad about him, and they'd be like, Jody, that's a pretty nice dog, you know. So one night we was hunting, and I said, Jody, I said, if you don't like him that much, if, if you're that disgusted with him, I said, why don't you just sell him to me? I said, uh, I'd love to have him. Oh, you don't want this old plug. He said, yeah, <laughs> we'd never talk again, you know. And I said, no, I said, I won't hold nothing against you. I said, I'll thank you. He said, well, you know, I've been thinking about selling him. And I said, well, how's this going to work? And he said, I promised him to Robert Johnson first. I said, okay. I said, and, and Robert's a good old dog man. I had all the respect in the world for him, you know, was taught to look up to our elders and stuff. So I went to Fred's the next day, and uh, this is kind of where it was going to go down. And I was sitting there, and Fred goes, uh, you really want to buy that dog? And I said, yeah. 
He said, you can do some winning with him, couldn't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> that dog needs to be put out there in the public eye and, and bred a little more. And Jody and Robert pulled up. And they was together. And I knew I was, I knew it was a done deal then. And uh, I said, what are you thinking, Jody? He said, Robert just bought him. You know, I said, no problem. I wish you but nothing but the best. And Robert would only take that dog down to the PKC World Hunt. Got him in, doubled him up a couple of times down there. And, uh, you know, the rest was kind of history. Robert would breed him to his females. Robert was known to have a lot of dogs and uh, good bitches. And uh, a couple of the other guys, Mark McGinn, got kind of hooked up with him when Robert was getting older and, and got a little taste of it. You know, uh, Bill and I had an uh, old stylish pretty girl. Bill had her there. It was a litter mate to him. Big old mouth, big stout female, but she was a little bit of a rattlehead, you know. Yeah. You, uh, she was the type of dog that uh, le less is more with her. She looked better if you just pulled her out of the box after about sitting there for a week and a half, and she'd treat coons. If you if you overhunted her, she just seemed like she just the wheels fall off. And Bill had her and bred her. Uh, lost that litter of pups off Schooner River Lift. Mm -hmm. Lucky he didn't burn your building down and stuff. Yep. That heat lamp that time and yep. he lost the puppies. And I don't know somewhere along the line. I had old stride at the time, and, and Ronnie and I was buying up some females, and Bill said, I'll just sell your girl. I said, all right, you know. I said, I'll just put your money in the freezer, and we'll, we'll go get her, and Ron went hunting all that night, and he said, what do you got here? I said, well, it's a little bit of a loose cannon here. It's kind of a gamble, but I said, uh, you're going to like her mouth, you know, and uh, the rest is kind of history. I made her a night champion in 2000. I won the Ohio State Championship with her. Fred and I was coon hunting the night before, went over there and uh, go and get a bowl of soup, see, check on some scores, and <laughs> kind of three, four hunters come in. He said, when's the last time you hunted a girl? I said, about two weeks ago. He said, what do you think? I said, you guide me? He said, yeah. Fred always had some coons. And uh, he said, let's bring her over tomorrow night. We scored nine and a quarter, you know, and won it, <laughs> you know. So, you know, she, she was that type of dog that looked better, you know, if you didn't hunt her much. But that was the first good cross, I think, coming off of uh, Stylish Clover. I think they was was Little Man right after that when they bred her to, to, to Stylish uh, Thunder Girl. I think it was, Dwayne. Uh, and then, you know, there was, out of that litter, was Stylish Little Stylish Man, Little Jinx. Man, Stylish Jinx from Chris Saunders and, and Stylish Boss Man. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a gold champion. Uh, his last owner was Bob Cooper had him, you know, at the time and John Bassett did a lot of winning with him. Uh, John also had a little man, you know, and, and won uh, Lee Crawford Hunt, placed in Southeastern Walker Days a bunch with him, and, and Walker Days, that Lee Crawford, you know, they had a knack to getting in there with him in the, in the PKC Spring Classic, you know. Well, tripod could tree them coons. He could trim. He could trim. Called him old tripod and half the time he'd run around on three legs and yeah. from getting hurt in that back hip. Yeah. <laughs> we started putting him on that Remedil. I remember, uh, you know, Ron Baldridge is a veterinarian around here and him and I teamed up on them dogs and he was one of the original owners with Old Stylish Queen back in the day with Gary Bridenball. And uh, Ronnie was busy going to vet school at the time so Gary kind of just took, took the reins on her and stuff. But, uh, I'd go to them hunts. I always, Ron always made sure I had something for them dogs if they, you know, got stoved up or sore or something. And we'd start giving them Remedil. It's an arthritis medicine, basically. He'd use that leg then, you know, especially if he put on, you know, treated a bunch or, you know, hunted a bunch hard that week, you know, it'd put him on it. But uh, he was a good one. He's another one that didn't probably get bred enough to either. And uh, nobody knowed anything about frozen semen at that time, I don't believe. You know, Junior Hale bought him there. Somehow Junior ended up, I don't know the whole deal. Him and Gary was involved in him, and Junior had him when he passed. And uh, Ron and I had stride, and, and Ron was a, one of, you know, he was a great partner on dogs. You know, he didn't, he never batted an eye if I told him I needed X amount of dollars on something. He'd say, well, go get it, you know. And uh, we had a conversation one evening. We, we was at his, <clears throat> at his house, and, uh, We'd go over there for Sunday night dinners, and his mom was a heck of a cook, God bless her. And uh, we'd sit there and get to talk a little business. And Ronnie's a businessman. And uh, he said, what do you think about trying to buy a little man? I said, what do you want to do with him? 
he said, let's study him out and get him bred like he should, go get him collected or something. And take him to Columbus. He said, I got some people down there in Columbus. We'll go fix that hip. Just kind of retiring. You know, he was a silver champion. He'd won like 8,000 grand night. So Ron made the calls to Columbus. And I think at that time it was going to cost us three or 4,000, you know, just to get that fixed. And I said, well, what are you thinking you, we ought to offer him? You know, I said, we don't want to embarrass nobody or whatnot. He said, well, go see. So we had a number in mind, and uh, he said, uh, go talk to Junior, see if we can get him. And, uh, boy, that was a hard no. You know, and the dog died there with him, and Junior had a bond with him. You know, that, a lot of people don't realize that these dogs were people dogs. They wanted to please you. Mm -hmm. And I just like that type of personality in them old black and white dogs. Yeah. Little man that minded like a kid. Junior and Bassett had spent a lot of time with that dog, and they'd get him out them hunts, never put a lead strap on him. Nope. Talk to him just like a kid. Little man, go get in that truck. Yep. And he'd just go right over and hop up in that truck. And <laughs> it, it was it was really something to see. Stride was like that, too. You know, and, those, and, and that goes to credit to John. John did that. He put yep. that handle on them dogs. As wild as Stride was, you could absolutely go in there, shoot a coon out, and you tell him to sit. Down, no lead strap he'd just say sit there and you could fool with a coon with another pup and he'd just sit there and watch you and never say a word and you could walk that pup out and say come on boy let's go and he'd walk right beside you and you'd turn your light on across the field and show him the truck so go get in that truck and every time he'd be standing on tailgate waiting on you when he got there <laughs> you know and I ain't taking no credit for that 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 come from John Bassett you know yeah. he, John, John was a good dog man back in the day and Spent a lot of time with them dogs, you know. Completely it was tough different. back then, you yeah. know. A lot of worn out boots is what we called it, you know. Yeah. Uh, a lot of worn out boots. You weren't you weren't driving across them fields, you know. Uh, for the most part, anyways, you know. You was uh, you had to go round them up. Yeah. And like I said, no GPS, so you was just in a an area with the old beep beeps. You know, you got to learn how to read them pretty good, uh, and it'd get you in that general vicinity. Yeah. You know. For sure, we could get over there where you could at least hear them. Right, <laughs> exactly. Another thing, back to these pups. I mean, uh, I think a guy ought to have a good handle on a pup before you try to get real serious about hunting. When they should know their name, they should have an idea what it means to be on a lead strap, yeah. what it means to be to be tied while you're trying to work them with a coon. I think a lot of guys. Just start taking them to the woods and all that is taken for granted and then while you're trying to teach that pup what's going on around that tree with that coon and you go tie him that first time he's got himself all knotted up in a knot <laughs> in that strap because he's never been tied yeah. uh, you take away all of what you're trying to do good gets canceled out because that pup is so confused about what's going on what what am i doing here why am why is these things got my legs all knotted up absolutely i agree with bill you know uh i lived in town <clears throat> excuse me i lived in town when i got married and i had a fenced in backyard and i could see the change then if i had a pup around there i could sit on the back porch and that bond that interaction you got to have that bond with them dogs uh that starts right then and there and then when i moved to where i live now i was blessed to be back off the road hundreds of acres of uh, timber and i got to letting them pups run loose and socializing and, and uh it just it it mentally matures them quicker than raising them in a pen like a chicken uh you can't just throw food at them and walk away and think that that's going to work it might work for some people in some some situation and not everyone's got the opportunity to live off the road someplace and yeah. and let a pup run loose and let it free range and i got some neighbors back in there and they got they got used to it you know and i'd apologize to them say hey you know send them back home you know they're supposed to be over here on the other side you know and uh it just helps them you know bill's got a great setup here uh to do the to do exactly what i was saying it just you can see there's a big difference in a pup that was raised in a pen, not shown attention, or one that's running loose, interacting with nature, mm -hmm. and uh, you're just putting your own handle on them at that time. You know, you got to spend time with them. It's like a kid. You get out of them what you put into it, you know. 
if you don't mess with them enough, you know, you're going to go to the cops and you're going to go to the cop station and, yeah. and get them out, you know. But uh, they're a lot of fun. I didn't have all the patience for it when I was younger. Uh, as I as I got older, I enjoyed working with them. So is that kind of, we can transition to pup training more. Do you just let them run loose in the very beginning? Of their, like I'm talking like puppy puppy, like once they're away from their mom, you just let them loose and kind of develop on their own for the first few months since I've moved here we live way back off the road and I, I let them pups run until they get to where they're running stuff out in the woods and 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 around me living right here I I used to try to walk them pups around and try to start them on squirrels but then down the road you have to break that dog off of that squirrel yeah. right so here, I kill every squirrel I see in this yard. I don't want them pups even seeing a squirrel. Because yeah. uh, you're just going to have to break them off of it later. And when they get there, when they're out in that woods every day running for a couple hours, running rabbits and stuff, it's time to start panning them up. St try to start focusing them on the coons. Yeah. You take a pup and he's running deer. Chuck told me this a long time ago. You take a dog that's running deer. He's running fox, he's training possums, and he's training coons. That dog's only spending 25% of his time coon hunting. Yeah. He's spending 75% of his time doing shit he's not supposed to be. Yeah. And, that, and, and take that into what Charlie said back then. That's part of the reason why when we bred Chirpy, we went to the, the Logan's Wild Clover. Because them dogs were naturally straight. There were no not to run much junk, mm -hmm. and we wanted that put in because Chirpy was a handful when she was young. She would run anything that would <laughs> lay a track, mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted that line of dogs for that reason. We wanted to get away from all that time spent trying to break them dogs off stuff they weren't supposed to be running. Yeah. So when you take that in consideration, that's why around the house here I don't. I don't like to let them get started, make a bad habit of running rabbits, and barking at squirrels. It, it pays off big dividends down the road. Yeah. And you really wouldn't realize that unless you had a place like Duane at back, in, back in that woods. And uh, what a difference that makes if you put a handle on that when they're little. Absolutely. You know, uh Bill's got a little water here behind his house, and then pups get used to, you know, swimming and getting in that kind of stuff. I've got the same kind of setup. Uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, I'm a firm believer, you know, if you can, I'd go buy a pair of pups and or, or raise a litter, I'd keep two here, and it's just easier to maintain and handle them two pups and, and letting them venture off, and I'm like Bill, you know, uh, when you start hearing them, when you got to, Put a tracking collar on them to let them run loose. It's time to start penning them up because they're going to get into something that you're not needing them to be involved in. Yeah. Uh, you're just asking for more problems down the road. Uh, and, and and a lot with these dogs, you know, these these black and white dogs and these, you know little clover bred dogs, whitey bred dogs. They, uh, from my experience, back in the day, messing with them, you needed to focus on correcting one problem at a time for them to stay in their right mind because these things were geared a little different than what we was used to having back as kids you know and, and we them dogs taught us a lot about coon hunting we you know it, it was it was it was changing it was a new era for us and uh, like I said earlier you know we was blessed to be around you know just the magnitude of good hounds you know Chuck was helping Gary breed Queen, and you know, they bred her to old Hardwood Bozo once, and out of that came Hardwood Patch. There was a dog called Stylish Boz that got in the final four of the PKC World Hunt. Was a really nice dog. Uh, too bad he was sterile and didn't know it because, you know, that dog probably would have threw something. You know, it would have been interesting to see what he threw. And then there was old Stylish Dolly and, and Stylish Molly. You know, Dolly was the AKC World Champion, Molly won the Pro Tour. You know, whatever they was breeding was just reproducing. And we, like I said, we was in a different era of dogs. 
and we we had to have some of it we wanted to be involved in it and uh but you know with each one of them dogs and those crosses and the whitey stuff you couldn't you was better off correcting one problem or focusing on one one goal mm -hmm. with them dogs uh it just confused them if you did too much with them absolutely so you, so you had to uh choose what you couldn't live with that particular time when you was hunting am i right bill absolutely yeah. and you had to have the right temperament i never had the right temperament to handle that shock and collar because i probably ruined more dogs than i helped with that <laughs> because it only takes one time to make a bad correction that that dog will never forget no and you'll put that little whatever you want to call it, queer streak or something yeah. in him and uh will you, haunt you forever oh you can do a lot of harm yeah, yeah. with a shock and collar in the wrong hands right and you can do a lot of good in the hands of somebody that's got the right mentality to handle it right mm -hmm. uh, so i try not to use that shocker too much unless i know you know even like running junk i don't like to shock them dogs for running something unless i see it yeah because there's been times when i'm thinking well, i'm just about ready to push that button that dog would roll up tree and i'm like whoo that was 30 <laughs> seconds it was about to get the juice and you know, i thought man you you just need to keep your hands off that shocker bill <laughs> you know and as, as, as uh i agree with bill a lot on that and as far as like when training these young dogs off this line what i started doing was i would give them <clears throat> x amount of time they're out there trailing 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 you know when is enough enough you know to try to get them to move on and teach them how to skip off them tracks i'd give them you know in this, depending on what time of year it was you know let's say summertime they get caught up out in a hundred acre cornfield or a bean field yeah i really didn't want to go in there and try to track them down but you know i'd give them 20 30 minutes if they can't come out of there it's time for me to go help them you know some people would go in there shock them out they'd just go into hiding just lay down out in them bean fields and, and how they didn't know what they're like he was trying to herd deer out of the damn woods we get four guys go through that woods and we'd all be screaming out get yeah. get and try and run them out of there <laughs> right you know so you just had to kind of encourage them a little bit you know you give them 20 minutes whatnot we'd start screaming and squalling and somebody had their windows open they're probably thinking what in god's green earth is going on out there <laughs> but we was moving them on you know you spend enough time on this one go find a coon track that you can run that you're comfortable with you know so it's just all the little stuff that you know it, they was naturals at what they did but you kind of had to help push them along to finish them into what we liked mm -hmm. yeah i guess is there a time of year that you notice they really shine more than others is probably colder weather kind of like what you're saying fall fall what, spring. I, fall, spring yep you know uh and i'm not trying to say nothing bad about other breeds or whatnot but you know i liked i like september end of september october november up till spring and when it started greening up and farmers crops are starting to prop up it was time to maybe go pull the boat out and go fishing or do something <laughs> like that because when we knew what we was going to get into and it didn't bother them dogs you know we we experimenting with the treadmills keeping them in shape rode them with the four-wheelers of the truck sometimes that you know did more for them at that time of year uh, you didn't have to hunt the guts out of them uh, versus for example when rat attack got real hot in, in the world you know and he, everybody knows what he put down he put tree dogs down them boys would pull them dogs out and you're looking up six seven trees in a cast and maybe looking at three or four coons at most you know uh no, don't get me wrong, they all weren't like that. There was a lot of good ones off of him, too. But, you know, that that kind of blew these dogs' mind, you know, when they was making them trees, and we, we touched on that earlier. So we could just put them back and maybe go do stuff with the family, take a vacation. Uh, we all had kids growing up, you know, then, it's, and uh, spend time with them and uh, enjoy that because God knows that goes by pretty quick, too. Yeah. I guess, like, what era was that? Like, what... Was that early 90s? Yes. So yeah. you want to move, I guess, 
later on into the 90s, kind of the next generation after that? Well, you started getting into Little Man <clears throat> and hunting offspring of his, and that's when I started hunting stride a lot. Mm. And uh, like I said, he was crazy wild. Uh, we bred him and advertised him, and uh, Ronnie and I did. And, uh, you know, he was... Them type of dogs, like for him, for example, if a, if a female wasn't just right and they'd come to your house, they wouldn't, they wouldn't just jump on them. They had to be ready, and you was going to get pups. What we started seeing, you know, we was trying to do a lot of lime breeding at the time, and we was, not only was we getting the good stuff, but we started getting some of the bad stuff, too, that we didn't want. Uh, so that's when I started noticing maybe a guy ought to breed something off a rat attack or maybe a little sack of junior in there throw a little clean maybe clean the tree dog up them dogs would grab some vines in there and clean the tree dog up on them and, and i remember you know chuck got you know that was probably chuck's concern he liked to listen to a a, a good clean tree dog and uh we had old Hayes, you know at the time stylish Hayes was hot and chuck was a big part of that with jimmy guess and you know, they liked listening to that certain style of tree dog versus what Bill and I would settle for, I guess, mm -hmm. what come with it, because we wanted to have coons in them trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, We were so happy with a 60-minute bark tree dog where Chuck and them was wanting that 120 bark minute tree dog. You had to start breeding some of that into these dogs to clean it up. You know, you started getting more duck-footed dogs. You know, mm -hmm. we was, you know, we was... The confirmation was leaving a little bit. It just kind of jogged my memory as I'm sitting here a little bit thinking, and, and I'm probably getting off base a little bit, but I want to talk about a female that was directly off of Whitey that never had a title in this world, uh, never never was put in the hunts. I handled her in one hunt for him, but old Bodenberg's fish. Uh, that was off of his females and stuff, old, old Wiggly. And... Uh, no time again female and I'm kind of getting off base here a little bit but that female is now in the PKC Hall of Fame for her reproduction that's how much Whitey done you know what you know he played a big part in a lot of this stuff and I do see a lot of these dogs nowadays he may be way back in that pedigree but I I look at those pedigrees and I can't help but think I know where this is coming from and Bill sees it in some of his dogs you know that stuff's coming from way down in the roots mm -hmm. you know I used to always say you know why breed to the branches when you can breed to the stump and uh, it kind of you know she was an outstanding female in her own right I mean she treat coons I tried to buy her one night you know uh, Fred had her and a litter mate they went in there and caught a coon on the ground it wasn't long I mean Fred said, she, fish won't stay there. She was going up in that next section, treat that coon. And <laughs> Fred's a good friend of mine. And I said, Fred, I said, uh, how much you take for that dog tonight? And actually, Bill put me on to her. Bill said, you need to go hunt with Fred. He's got a for real bitch over there. He said, if you can get her bought. He said, but you know how they are. They're born at Fred's house. They'll die there at Fred's house. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, those are his kids, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, God love him, you know. And I went down and we went hunting that night. And I don't know if Fred and I hunted a bunch. And, uh. I just said, Fred, we was walking back up the truck. I said, I'm going to ask you, would you sell that dog? And he said, ah, I don't think I could, Dwayne. I said, well, I didn't ask you if you could. I said, will you? <laughs> and we got up there on walking to the road, and I remember it like it was yesterday, and I said, what would it take to buy this dog? You know, she was just a puppy. I said, 2500 And I had a whole pocket full of cash that night, and I was, I was bound to turn I was coming home with her. He said, ah, oh, he said, that wouldn't touch it. I said, well, then how much would it? You know, 3000 now. So I thought, well, Fred likes money. So, <laughs> and I do too, and I don't like getting rid of it, but you know, I thought, I'm going to own this dog here. So I said, would four do it? No. So we got up to the road, and I said, Fred, I said, I'm going to make you another offer here on old fish. I said, uh, you know, we can work this out any way you want. I said, would you take 5000 for her? And he said, I, I, I'm just going to keep her, Dwayne. I thank you for the offer. So I always kind of hung around, and I had some dogs off old fish. And Fred come over and bred a female. You know, he bred old fish to stride and different things. And that's where we got old Gatorade and all them. You know, and uh, 
So I respect that he kept her till he died, and, and he used her in some of our stuff. Because Fred could have took her anywhere he wanted to, you know. But he, he come over, and he believed in the black and white stuff, too. But, you know, he also knew that we had to throw a little bit something different in there to, to mix it up to, to get the blend real good. Uh, I guess that's where I was going with that story. Mm -hmm. But uh, And it's been successful for Fred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish he would do one of these, but every time I ask him to get on here, he's not interested in... Fred's... You ain't gonna get Fred to do it, you know. Uh, well, that's the problem when you get to be our age. Yeah. Clayton, you'll find that out when <laughs> yeah, you get, get there, there. But uh, yeah. and Fred's it's hard to remember stuff that happened 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, for me, last week. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and to be honest with you, you know, I've, I've been working a bunch, and uh, Fred and I don't see each other or text much like we used to in the past, and... He reached out to me the other week, and, and uh, he said, hey, he said, uh, these fellas wanting to hear the story about old Whitey. He said, uh, you know, they're trying to get Bill to do it, and they're trying to put the right people together to do this. And I said, oh, Fred, I said, I'm an old has-been. I said, uh, he said, no, but he said, you and Bill, you spent lots of nights together. He said, uh, you two need to tell the story. And uh, I said, ah, oh, I said, this, somebody else probably tell the story a little better, you know. And, uh, not that I was kind of blowing him off or nothing. Like I said, I respect him and stuff. And it wasn't long then. I'm at work and, and uh, I work at the local high school and I was I was cleaning the bathrooms and I get this text pops in and it's Bill. And I said, oh, Fred's done did reached out and got this going now, you know. <laughs> and Bill says, hey, he said, you get a minute. He said, could you give me a call? I said, I'll call you soon. And I said, I talked with Fred. So it was good, you know, uh, that we... Uh, got this all put together tell a little story about it all and, and uh, I'm sure we missed a bunch but uh, I'm glad Fred put it together and I heard Birchall was involved in it and Birchall's another good guy having a lot of success with uh, with Frog you know and uh, we can touch a little bit on that you know he's you know there's Whitey in that top and bottom in there and uh, I've always been and you know I like I like a good bitch line and I ain't trying to take nothing away from Frogger's daddy, you know, but, uh, you know, he was passed around and, and bred, and he really wasn't throwing nothing, and I'm a firm believer that what's happening with the Frogger phenomenon, you know, going, what's going on here, I really do believe it's, it's not, and like I said, I'm not trying to say nothing bad about Spinal Tap, I think it's, if you look deeper down in that pedigree, I think that's where it's really coming from, uh, Frogger's mother well, was a hell of a bitch, you know, she Coon Trier. And I think a lot of that's coming from that clover stuff back in there. He don't look like no clover dog. He looks a little more like like Flair, like his mom, you know, yeah. and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's uh, he doesn't look like Spinal Tap. So I think it's coming back from another gene in there. And I'm, I'm truly happy that for, for Birchall and all the success that he's had, you know, they don't make him no better than Birchall. Uh, he's a good dude. Uh, I've got all the respect in the world. I got to know him back in the day when we was hunting the black and white dogs, uh, and he was hunting English dogs, God forbid, you know. He, <laughs> he, you know, I won't hold nothing against him. You know, he was he was hunting the old Swamp Brewster stuff, and his dad was big in them English dogs, you know, but he finally seen the light, you know, and come over <laughs> here to the other side. So I got to give him a little dig there, you know. Uh, he's a good dude. He's a good dude. Clayton, why you why you talking? We we probably ought to bring up another little dog. It was kind of special to me and a, to a lot of people really. And her name was Jukebox Maudie. Oh she, yeah, she come from Junior Junior Jackson. We had all three of them that summer. Yep. Oil Key and Harry and handsome uh, handsome Harry and Oil Key and Harry. Junior got in a bad car wreck. Was going to be in a bad way for a while. And he called and said, "Man, Bill, I got three dogs down in here." And, I'd like to go partners with you on him because I'm not going to be able to hunt for quite a while. So we went up there and got old Jukebox Loud, I believe he called That's him. That's what it was. Jukebox Loud, Handsome Harry. Handsome Han Oil Can Oil Harry. Oil Can Harry. And Jukebox Maudie. Yeah, she was fun. Yeah, old Maudie, when, when we brought her home, she had like hip, hip dysplasia, I'm mm. going to say is what it was. She would hop like a rabbit in her back end, and I'd let her run around the turkey farm there, and she would very, she, she wouldn't, she just wouldn't leave the yard. She'd just lay on that porch, so I started giving her some calcium pills. 
by God, in about three weeks after giving her them calcium pills, a neighbor called up one day and said, Hey, there's a dog down here, coon dog down here, got one of my house cats to read. <laughs> and went down and it was old Maudie. And then we started coon hunting old Maudie. She was, she was a ball to hunt. I can't tell you how many coons that little dog treed in less than a minute. We had a lot of fun. Oh, she her. was. She was. I hated one. to see her go. Oh yeah, she could run a track. If there was a track to be run. She could run it and get it treed, or she could pop them coons up along the face of that woods, like we talked about earlier. Treat them like popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, junior and uh, Junior and what? The, what's the guy's name? Had the restaurants down there. Was hooked up with Junior. Man, I hate Leon Childers. Leon Childers. <laughs> They ended up buying my half out on that little dog. I mean, they've they've done a lot of winning with old Marty. Yeah. Uh, but she was a different style dog than what I'm used to, mm -hmm. and so was Oil Can Harry and Loud. They were they were different style dogs than what than what I was used to. But it it was a welcome change because uh, man, they could really treat them. It was it was well, Bill's right on. It was a welcome change. We spent a lot of time that summer, like I said, uh, hunting them three. And I didn't have nothing involved in them, you know. I just liked listening to them, and it was a lot of fun. And it kind of gave us a break from what we what we was dealing with, you know. And I think it was kind of like a, you want to say, just recharged our batteries and had yeah. some fun with something that was totally different than what we was used to messing with, yeah. you know. Yeah. Here's a funny story, and you may have to edit this out, but I remember one of the first coons at Oil Cat Harry treed, me and Duane. And that dog treat behind a man's house trailer. I can tell you right where it was. It's like three or four o'clock in the morning. And it's like one of the first coons he treats. I packed that rifle in there. And Dwayne said, man, you're right up behind that house trailer. I said, I'll be back. <laughs> I went in there and I get to shooting, trying to shoot that coon out to that dog. Billy never was known to be a good shot here for a while. <laughs> and uh, it didn't take very long. That man stepped out of that house trailer and he emptied a nine millimeter pistol. And, and you're going and, and you're going to laugh about this. I'm sitting down the road, okay, and uh, not to interrupt your part of the story, but Bill comes running up the road and I still hear Harry back in their tree. And this man's just unloaded this pistol on this deck. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm out of bullets. <laughs> I said, uh, this man's shooting at you. He said, but I'm going to kill that coon. He said, you got any more bullets? I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, you didn't think about just walking off that tree? He said, I'm killing that coon. <laughs> and this man's out there screaming, thinking Bill's still out there. And he's at the truck getting more bullets. Next thing you know, I hear Bill down in there, pop, pop, pop. And all of a sudden, I hear this nine go off again, pop, 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 pow. And I thought, well, I don't know what's going to happen here, but we're going to see. Here come old Bill. He comes walking up. And he said, I said, you get it done? He said, finally. I said, well, good. I said, I hope that man sleeps good the rest of the night. But I highly doubt he did. But that was uh, that was, <laughs> that was a true story, too. True story. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of adventures like that. Oh, my gosh. I tell another one where one night, you want to tell some stories, you know, about Bill and I going back. No, Stylish Dolly, she was a, a wood gym. Now, she may treat 20 coons in a row, but she may treat 20 blanks just as quick. <laughs> but, damn, she sounded good doing it. So we're down on the river one night, and uh, oh, lo and behold, she's got a coon. Bill says, uh, I'm going to shoot that coon out. I said, all right. He said, I'll stay right down in here. He said, you go out there in the field. I said, all right. I said, I'll shoot it out. I shoot this coon out, and all of a sudden I hear boom, big thud, and boo, all this noise going on. And I said, my God, what the hell just happened? I go down there, and that coon come down, hit Bill right on the shoulder, knocked him down. He rolled down that bank. He was laying down in this ravine, just <laughs> knocked the air out of him. Hit me in the shoulder, hit me right in the yeah. eyeball. Well, that coon's I... nose hit me right in the yeah. eye. Oh, my God. Yeah, and there's Bill down in there with Dolly. They're all fighting this coon together. I didn't know who was chewing on it the most, you know, and all just Bill down in there squalling so. You know, we've had a lot of good times, a lot of good times uh, with these old dogs, for sure, for sure. Any other stories like that? That's I kind of want to transition into more just stories kind of like that over the years. Well, there was another night, me and Dwayne and his dad, and I believe a fellow by the name of Jeff Bentley was together down along the river section, and we shot this coon out. Dwayne's dad had stayed back at the truck. Well, that coon no more hits the ground. There's three dogs fighting it. I look up and I see a light coming up through that woods. 
I said, somebody's coming. Everybody grabbed their dogs and took off running, but Jeff, he went to run and forgot to grab his dog. Yeah. <laughs> He had to run back and get his dog with it. Ended up being Dwayne's dad. Come down in there and look. Scared the scared the dog crap out of us, didn't he? He, uh, I got another one. We was uh, we was over hunting with this dog trader over in Indiana, and uh, he was he was buck wild. This guy this guy was crazy, and uh, he you know he had some good hunting. And we'd laugh and we we'd go over there. We didn't even buy no Indiana hunting license. We'd just go over there and he'd say, Ah, you don't need them, you know. Off we go, we'd tree a bunch of coons. And he had teenagers. This, yeah, with teenagers. And, uh, and we just barely had enough gas money, enough eats, and pack a little cooler, ride mom and dad's refrigerator, get some drinks, you know. We'd go over there, and we, uh, dog got treed. And uh, it didn't matter what time of year it was. If it was up in the arrow, that old man was shooting it. <laughs> and uh, we was over in there, and all of a sudden he said, hey, we got to go, we got to go, we got lights coming, you know. So he sends Bill and I on a wild goose. He said, you guys go over this way, and I'll meet you on this next stone road. So we're, this guy's getting close, and uh, we're on our hands and knees. We're, you know, I don't know why we was on our hands and knees. We thought we was going to get down in the dang bushes, I guess, and we're just trying to sneak, out, sneak of out of there. And all of a sudden, we're just going. And I was just a little bit lower than Bill at the time. And all of a sudden, I'm like, didn't even all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it was just like somebody had shot him. I turned around. And I said, "What that's going on?" He said, "God." He said, "I just got shocked." I said, "Shocked?" I said, "What by what?" There was this electric <laughs> fence around this lot, and we was, I crawled right underneath it. Never even saw it. We was, you know, didn't have no lights on, and it got Bill right across the chin, and I like to laid him out. And it burnt. We laughed about that. It, he had this big old red mark right across his chin. It just laid him back like somebody had shot him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my lord yeah we still have yeah, that's a that was that was interesting for sure oh there's thousands more guy could tell but we better save that for another day yeah yeah he'll be needing to do a part two on it yeah uh, we, if you want to any other time we can. <laughs> no it's been a blast I, i've truly enjoyed you uh reaching out and and, and bill and, and fred and all of them uh i'm gonna lie i was a little nervous about doing it all myself but uh I've had a great time doing this with you, Clayton. I appreciate what you're doing uh, with the Coon Dog World, you know, there's, and the the memories and the friends that I've made across the country traveling. Uh, you know, Bill used to always tell me, you know, you don't want to draw Dwayne at them hunts, you know. He said, he'll be your buddy, we'll drink beer, we'll go have fun. But, man, when, that's, when that clock's on for two hours, I didn't care who was in that cast. You know, I was wanting to win, you know. And, them, and people knew that I was hard on them boys around here. And some of them was like, how are we going to do this? But, you know. And it was all done. We was all good. Let's go tree coons, you know. <laughs> Junior Jackson always said it the best. He said, you cannot judge a man in two hours while he's competing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You, you know, cannot I agree judge with a you. man's character. That's right. In two hours when a man's competing. That's right. You know, I agree with that. Nope. That was a good <laughs> statement right there, you know. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you know, I mean, when we done this back in the day, you know, our families, man, they just, they was on back in the second burner you know mm -hmm. they just should have done a few things right but we didn't you know at the time that's all we knew you know i mean that's all we knew was to turn them dogs loose and i'm glad you know i mean most people would die to have the opportunity to to follow the dogs that we did you know uh, and god blessed us with with just some great dogs and hey they all didn't make it don't get me wrong we went through a lot of them you know you got any more stories oh i got a lot of stories <laughs> i tell you back in the day uh what kind of set right before the old whitey days and i don't know if this is even going to make the the airwaves or not but there was a dog back in the day called ohio brush he was a night champion dog he was just no coon trainer and uh we them boys you know bill girding ron avish old hippie he's passed away now uh they was hard on them coons. They was hard on them. And them boys hunted every night. And we aggravated the hell out of them guys. And uh, probably seen some stuff we shouldn't have saw back in the day running around with them boys. But, uh, you know, we got introduced to cigarettes, chewing tobacco, and everything else, you know. But, uh, hell, we wanted to be part of the clique, you know. 
so we'd uh, we'd follow them around. They'd pick us up, and Ryan's brother, uh, Norb, uh, which I've got recently reacquainted with, is a super nice guy, and he uh, he had an old female, an old Finley River bred female called Judy, and bred her, and Dad bought me a pup. And that was my first, one of my first pups. She got, we didn't have kennels in. we just tie them out on chains in a doghouse, and we went down to the lake that weekend and come home Sunday evening. She was laying out there along the road dead. She broke the chain. And, but we, you know, that kind of, you know, back then, that we wanted to be like them guys, or I did anyways. You know, them boys was going to them hunts, and they made him a night champion and sold him to, a, I can't remember, a veterinarian up in Michigan. And uh, he lost him in a swamp or something. He was treated for a couple of days or something and lost his voice. But they ended up with him back and... Uh, you know, he put some decent stuff on the ground back in the day. Kind of, you know, them dogs taught us a little bit, too. But uh, nothing like the old Whitey era, though. Mm -hmm. 90s was good to us. Is there anything else you want to say about Whitey or any of the other dogs? Is there any dogs that we should talk about that we haven't talked about? Oh, I'm sure there is, Clayton. Well, I'm sure we missed some, and if we did, it's not, it wasn't by, you know, we didn't do it intentionally. Yeah. You know? I want people to know that, you know, we didn't miss nothing. You know, there was a lot of good ones in there, you know. Uh, and I'm sure I'll drive home here tonight and think about <laughs> it and say, oh, boy, we missed old so-and-so. So if we did, it wasn't done intentionally, and I apologize, you know, ahead of time. But uh, We probably should mention that cross on old Queen and old stylish jukebox, the Jackson Boys jukebox. Yeah. That, that was, was a good cross, That too. was a good cross, yeah. too. You know, that was... Uh, I believe old box, the one I had, ended up being uh, he got our the fourth place of the world UKC yeah. World yeah. Hunt yeah. was it? Uh, junior, he yeah he placed second with his PKC I World Hunt. PKC he world was sterile. Hunt. He was sterile. Yeah, uh, yeah. I tell you a story about that one night. Uh, old box was just an old jukebox was a good old country, and it took some convincing to get Gary to breed old queen to jukebox i don't think he was on board at first you know but uh jukebox to these dogs like old bill's old box dog was just an old stout droopy eyed thing you know just and he was type we was hunting one night me and bill and john and they was started and we always had snacks in the truck you know and uh bill couldn't understand why old box wasn't doing nothing and, he's uh, like trailing and it wasn't doing well no John's was trailing. Bill had no idea. John was over here feeding crackers to old box on the other side of the truck. <laughs> and we was sitting on a boy, old Bill was like, where in the heck's mine at, you know? Wonder why he ain't in there doing much. John's over there just laughing. He's feeding <laughs> crackers and stuff over there. He'd check back in or something, you know, and he's over there and I'd laugh. But, you know, just, uh, we all did it in fun, you know. We, you know, we, we took it serious and, uh, but old Box went on to make a good one. You know, Martin Spears had him down there in Mississippi and uh, got in the finals of the UKC World Hunt and then Junior got in the finals of the PKC World Hunt with his. Both them dogs had good mouths, yeah. good come get me locates. Sure enough. Yeah, that was a good cross on old Queen. Yeah. Yeah. Queen done her part. She was the foundation. You know, without Queen, we couldn't have had well Whitey, you know, because we got Chirpy off of Queen and Lipper, and then, you know, Chuck and Bill there went and bred to, to Wild Clover. So, you know, you got to have got to have good bones. And uh, sure enough, you know, we was, we was truly blessed to, to capitalize on it, you know, and, and other people in the, around the world, you know, Ed Yates come up and bought a slew of them. You know, he'd bring that camper up here and stay with Kurt. Mm -hmm. He had old Hideaway Magnum Mike then, you know, he thought Mike was the best thing since sliced bread, you know. And, he got to seeing some of this other stuff, and, you know, he started spending some of that money there, you know, <laughs> start scooping them up, you know, he was helping us all out back in the day. He ended up treeing seven tenths of a mile. I had my light on coming in, and he had another coon, so turned him loose three times, he had three coons. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,